All righty, let's hop right into it. Hi, Todd. Welcome in. Okay, so feel free to go ahead and drop your guys' questions into the Q&A. Um, if not, before we jump in, I can go ahead and start showing. No worries. Why don't we talk about wins? Um, I haven't had a lot of questions with you guys that have to do with wins or anything like that. What are some things that are going well in your guys' system or some things that you guys are like, hey, this is really working well for me. It's made my system easier. Um, what are some of the features that you guys have been playing around with recently that you're like, wow, I really like the way this is used. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about those. I do have a couple topics that were really, really popular in um, support recently um that we can definitely take a peek at and talk about um as well today um but if we don't have anything right now i'll go ahead and just start off with talking about the um, support options that we have within open to close um as always if you guys need to chat with us you can use this little chat icon here and send us a message and chat with us here otherwise you can always email us at help at open to close.com um, if you need any assistance there now, if you're logged in or you're on our main web page and you're looking for more like um, webinars, similar to how we have one today, you can go to our learn tab and click on webinars. This will take you to our webinar page and just show you the different webinars that we have coming up. So today we just completed the Fields 101 about an hour ago. Um, next week, we're going to be going over tasks and triggers 101. And then the following Wednesday, we're going to be talking about contacts 101. Um Tasks and Triggers is a great class to come on and learn about task templates and how to build them and how they work and triggers and how, how to build those and how they work specifically on those task templates, as well as, you know, the other parts of um, triggers that can come into play, depending on, you know, what your skill set is. Awesome. The other options that we have are our learning guides or our help guides. These are written um these are, this is written content that you guys can go through and you guys can read about. So if you're interested in any of the topics, I'm going to learn about task templates, Hannah. Type in task templates and kind of run from there with it. When is the task uh, trigger webinar? So next Wednesday, uh, next Tuesday at, I believe, 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, so definitely make sure you update that um, that. Uh, time zone for you guys, you know, whatever it ends up being for you guys. Um, but right now it's just 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I can grab the link for this registration too. And I will have my co-host send that over to you. All righty. So it looks like so the fog has finally lifted and responding to the system changes. Requests are fairly easily. We've implemented a lot of differentiations uh, and bringing in templates to fine tune things. Wonderful. I'm really glad. Like it's, it's definitely something where as it starts to kind of like wind up, you know, and as you start to use the system more, you start to go, wow, like I kind of am starting to get it. I really feel like when you're starting out with the systems um, and you're like, okay, how do I really, really start to like utilize open to close? Or, you know, maybe you've been on the system for the first three months and you're like, okay, how do I jump into this? How do I get deeper into this? We're really talking about those conditions and we're talking about getting into building out conditions either on your intake forms. Sometimes it's going to be on your smart blocks and depending on what plan you're on, maybe you're even looking at conditions on, you know, tasks tasks or email templates or task triggers, what those look like. So um, some of the top questions that we have or frequent asked questions that we've seen in support um, have directly been related to um, specific uh, conditions. Um, specifically, we're talking about like either or conditions, multiple select conditions. We can talk a little bit about um, intake forms, uh, form conditions, and um, intake form triggers. Um, and then we'll probably touch on some conditional date templates like that as well. So 
within open to close. If you guys are looking for that next step and you're not already using your intake forms, um, intake forms are going to be a great next step. If you are using intake forms and you're trying to, you know, revamp it, build it out even more, have some more um, functionality with it. What I usually suggest is like when you fill out that intake form, write down your pain points with it. Oh, you know, when I fill out this field, I really want this contact to come up, but it's not coming up. Or when I, when I enter in this data, you know, I want more than just this, you know, maybe I need a text area for my agent to write in some, uh, an additional um, claims about, you know, inspections or uh, about the appraisal or financing, or maybe there's additional information that that agent always sends you guys after you've already, you know, had that intake form filled out. And you're like, you know, it'd be great if I had that on my intake form. The first step to going through those is obviously going to be making sure that we have the field in it. So I'm going to click on my three line icon, head over to our field editor. And we'll just want to make sure that that field is in here first, whether that's a text area, if you're like, I need a paragraph from that particular agent, or if it's a choice option, because you need to know what options are we doing for this particular person. So for example, a, a choice option that we looked at today when we were talking about fields was what photo types would you like to order? For photo types, right now it has this list of photo types here. And one thing that I want to note is that it's also set to be set as multiple select. So what this means is that if they wanted to, they'd be selecting uh, more than just one of these options on here. Now, one thing with multiple select that everyone should keep in mind is that we don't currently have the ability to use that in conditions. And the main reason is, is because there's a ton of iterations of what that could be. We want it to be standard photo packaging or videography or Twilight, plus maybe some virtual tour, you know, it, the more options we have when we talk about multiple select, it really opens up for more, um, uh, more conditions. <laughs> now, another uh, field that might be a good example of having like um, an either or option could be the, um, let's head over into our intake questions. Um, we could probably say what kind of inspections are there right? This could be an example of when an either or might be very helpful. Maybe we have well, septic, roof, um, uh, pool, you know, a couple different options here. And let's say that for well and sept or for well and pool, they're the same, right? Maybe it's the same water source. So we need someone to inspect that pool. We need someone to inspect that well, make sure that the pumps are good, right? Maybe they're, the pumps are in the similar area. So you could use an either or for that. So how do I build on an either or? Well, we're going to head to our intake forms. We're going to locate the intake form that we want to edit. So I'm just going to go into my buyer's residential. I'm going to go to my intake questions. And I just want to make sure that what kind of inspections are there or what kind of inspections is a field that's being currently used. So I'm going to grab the name of that field. Um, I just highlight it and then do control C or control uh, uh, command C on my keyboard just to copy it. We're going to go into our form conditions. Now, form conditions are how we're bringing on fields or documents or um, contact rules onto that intake form. Um, but here, what I can do from here is I can click on the condition action map. This allows me to see, okay, well, when this is equal to what, what does it do next? So I'm going to just do control F or command F if you guys are on a Mac. And then I'm going to do control V or command V if you guys are on a Mac and see is what kind of, uh, in, what kind of inspections is that being asked on my intake form at all? Doesn't look like it comes on at all. Let's see if my inspections just come on. So let's see. Cool. Will there be an inspection that comes on when it's equal to yes, it brings on types, uh, type of inspections and it brings on inspection days. So I'm going to go ahead and click on where it says secure form. It's going to open up a copy of this particular intake form. This is just basically, we've had some changes to the way our naming conventions are. So think of secure form as just previewing that form. Um, public form is something that we're currently working on. Um, so it's a little bit of a sneak preview for anyone who's like, Ooh, what does that mean? So here I've popped open that intake form. I'm going to head down to our, will there be an inspection question and answer it? Yes. When I answer it yes, I know based off of the form conditions that more fields are going to populate. So if I continue to scroll down, here's my other form conditions. We've got this where it says type of inspection. It says general, pest, pool, radon, um, roof. 
So let's see if this one is also a multiple select. It looks like this one is also a multiple select here where we can select more than just one option. I would probably want to change this field into radio buttons. That way it has more of a look kind of like these um, versus having this drop down select because that can sometimes be confusing. But let's say I wanted to add on that additional field that I had. So I'm going to head back over to my form conditions. I'm going to get out of the, the form uh, condition map. I'm going to head back down to that inspections. Here, will there be an inspection? We're going to click on edit action, and I'm going to add in that other inspection question. So we have that inspection question. What kind of inspections? Let's bring that on there. We're not going to make it required for now, but we're just going to bring in that specific field. I'm going to go ahead and go back over to my intake form, and I'm going to select cancel form. Anytime I make changes to my form conditions, I'm going to want to cancel the form so that I can relook at what that form looks like with the new um, information. So we'll click on secure form. Once we click on secure form, I'm just going to choose random people. I'm not going to put in an address because we're not really worried about the address right now. We just want to see what happens when we bring on this field next. So I say yes. This question comes on. I can say, OK, well, I know for sure we need to pull one, right? So this would be if we were only selecting one of the options. So if we select pool, right? Maybe we also know that if it's pool or if it's well, we need our well task template to come on. So here I might say, oh, well, they have a pool. So for sure we want to do this, right? When we're talking about creating our either or conditions, you have to think of what are the other reasons that you could want to trigger this particular um, field, field section, task template, or, or document template to come on. Um, I think one of the other suggestions that I usually have is like, for example, when we have something that's equal to buyer, right? An example of an either or condition for this one could be that, well, I do want to do these tasks and I need this document template for when it's a buyer, but I also need it for when it is equal to a dual. So when it's, when it's someone who's on both sides of the party. So to create that either or, here I've got that initial condition, contract client type is equal to buyer. Here where it says field, I'm gonna select field. Once field's been selected, it's gonna say I'm creating a child condition. Here I'm gonna choose the condition type. I can say property field. From here I can say I'm looking for that contract client type. It's the same field that we were just using, but instead of us choosing um, buyer, we're gonna instead choose dual. Now I've said property field contract client type is equal to dual. I'll say add. And now we've got that if it's equal to buyer or if it's equal to dual, that's when it's going to apply this particular task template, document template um, to the property. So definitely take a peek at those. That's that's kind of where um, if you were creating any either or um, conditional logic, um, there are obviously other places that you can create conditional logic as well. You can use that conditional logic, that either or condition on your property triggers. You can use it on your task templates um, or your task template triggers. If you guys are on the scale plan, you can use it for um, for con uh, conditions on smart blocks as well. Let's say we said something where we need either yes, there is an HOA or an HOA contact needs to exist on the property. Um, that's another example of an either or um, condition. So lots of information. We just talked about mainly, um, you know, our, how to create those fields, how those fields relate on our property, how to update them, what they look like showing up on the intake form as well. Now, another question that we've been getting a lot with um, our intake forms is just what's the difference between form conditions and form triggers? So the main thing that I want to stress is that form conditions are dynamically adding additional fields, contact roles, or documents or file roles to that intake form. Okay. So it's specifically for adding onto that intake form. This is the time when you'd be coming to your form conditions to say, well, when I say this, is there a loan equal to yes? I need it to bring on, clicking on the condition action map. I need it to bring on, you know, the lender. It looks like it's bringing on the lender twice here. I also need the loan application due days um, and the loan approval due days. And that's because I've said, yes, there is a loan. Now, one thing with form conditions is that when we're talking about form conditions, we're always dealing in positives. So when you go to build out that form condition, I'm just going to grab a random one right here. 
what you guys are going to take notice of is that when you go to choose your operation, you have to say equal to, because we're trying to say, okay, when you make this selection on the intake form or when the agent does, what do we want to happen next? So it's always going to be equal to, it's not going to be not equal to, because that creates way more variations than necessary. Um, we're trying to work with the most simplest way of logic, which is if it's equal to this, then what happens next, right? Now on the other side, the other part with this, and I think a great example is kind of, you know, with our inspections, will there be an inspection equal to yes? When that's equal to yes, it brings on some more other options. But what about that field section that we have underneath our transaction details? Because if I go down to my inspection details, what I want you guys to take notice is that I do not have any of those fields selected. So I have my form condition. It asks for inspections. It says, yes, and we fill out a couple details. Now, how do I get this detail section onto my property? I only want this to come on when inspections are equal to yes. So instead of having these buttons selected here, right? I don't need these selected here. Instead, when I know that I need this field section inspection details to come onto a property, I know that now I need to stop looking at my form conditions and start looking at my form triggers. Now, if you guys are working with a pre-built account, you might already have triggers in here that are built out to bring on these specific field sections. Definitely click on your trigger options. Definitely use that command F feature so you can see if you can find that particular trigger. So you can double check what logic is it using. Is it the same as what's with my form conditions? Perfect. I know when I say yes, this inspection details will come on. If you're brand new and you're like, I don't have that yet, Hannah. Actually, I'm working on a brand new intake form. It is empty. How do I build that out? We're going to select add trigger. The trigger action is going to be when it's submitted by the agent. I have a preference for having submitted by the agent anytime we're talking about fields. When we're talking about task templates, document templates, that's when I usually say, let's change this up to a form approved. Um, and the reason I do that is because when that property is initially populated, I want to see the fields that are available, right? I want to know, okay, well, I see inspection details, which means they said yes to inspection. Let me double check the contract to make sure that we actually are handling an inspection. Um, for our tasks, I don't really want those to come up when I'm on my approval stage or I haven't approved the intake form yet because I really don't want to worry about, okay, what happens if uh, you know I, uh, I start checking off tasks? Right. And I just start moving along with the transaction. I haven't even approved that intake form yet. Right. So I usually like to say, save it for when it's after approval. That way, when you see those tasks populate, you know, okay, awesome. Now it's time for me to go through and um, actually kind of run that transaction. So with fields, we'll go ahead and say form submitted. For our trigger function, we're selecting, do we want to send an email, a text message, add or remove a template, add or remove a field section or an individual field? Now we want all of the inspection details, right? We want everything within that field section. So we'd say field section. If I wanted to bring on just one or two or three or even five or six fields, I could say I want individual fields to come on. The main difference between a field section trigger and a field trigger is going to be that when I say a field section, if I add on more fields into that field section later on, let's say I figure out, oh, you know what, actually for my inspection details, I want to remove some of these fields and I want to replace them and I want to add in some more fields. Or let's say I'm reviewing my account and I'm like, oh, you know what, I don't have an inspection status field. I would love to add that in so that it comes on every single time I say inspections are yes. When you're working with a field section trigger, like what we have right now, this is going to allow you to bring on those fields anytime new fields are added to that field section. If we say that it's an individual field and it brings on individual fields from that field section and you say, well, I need that inspection status to come on to every single property, you know, that I fill out, you would have to go back, locate the trigger and make sure you add that individual field to the trigger as well. So not only are you adding it to your um, fields in your field editor and adding it to all of the properties that you already have that are existing, but you're also having to go into that intake form to make sure that you have that new field that you just created added into that trigger. So that's kind of like the use case behind this. So I'm going to select um, field section. I'm going to say add. Here it's going to ask me what field section we want. We're going to say our inspection details. Oop, I didn't click on it. I clicked right next to it. There we go. Inspection details and say add. Here are the options right here. Obviously, we can delete this field section if we don't need it. 
We have the ability to say whether everything in that field section is internally required. Not super typical, especially since you might have fields in there that you don't know yet, right? It's just at the beginning of the transaction, this these fields come on and they say, hey, when's the inspection scheduled? Maybe you haven't even reached out to send over here are the list of recommended inspectors from the agent, right? So we'd want to leave this as no for now. And then here, this is just add or remove. Now, my best practice is you always want to work in addition, right? So it's better to have a very bare bones intake form and say, well, I want to add on these fields when we meet these particular qualifications, right? When we say yes, where is, there's an inspection, yes, there's HOA, yes, there's financing, yes, there's an appraisal versus having it say, well, I want them to come on every single time, but remove them when I don't need them, right? It's better to say when I need it, bring it on. If I don't need it, don't even need to worry about it. It's also a lot easier when you're troubleshooting too. So now that I've added that on there, I can add other field sections if I'd like to, but this is good enough for me for now. I can say close. I'll click on trigger options. That just expands the trigger for me. I'll flip that trigger on. Usually what I like to do is grab the name of the trigger assets and add into the details, add, and then paste in those trigger assets. When it's purple, I'm editing it. When I press enter on my keyboard and goes from purple to gray or purple to white, if you're looking at other parts of the system, that means that it's saved. This is gonna save you a lot of effort so that when you go to sort your triggers, you know which trigger this is and you know where to put it, right? That's the whole idea behind the details. The next thing we wanna do is add on our condition. So we wanna say, add the condition, a property field, oop, not file type, property field, is there, oh, actually let's type an in inspection. That'll get us to it faster. Will there be an inspection is equal to, again, I like to deal with positives, especially when we're talking about our fields, it makes it a lot easier. We wanna match whatever you're using for your form conditions on your form triggers as well. So here equal to yes, add that on there. Here it says equal to yes. And now this trigger is built out. You can add on more conditions if you'd like to. You can say, well, it needs to be equal to yes, or I need the contact role inspector, say home inspector, um, exists in the property as well, right? And this can have it that that home inspector, either we're saying yes, there's an inspection or that home inspector exists on the property. Maybe they um, were entered in, you know, when they've said yes, they also entered in that contact role or your agent didn't say yes. And they said no, because they didn't know, know about the other information. But then when they got to that contact screen, they added in a home inspector. That could be another reason why it brings on those fields, right? So there's a couple of ways that we can kind of build it out where we can say, you know, depending on how they fill out things will depend on how it brings in. Cool. I'm going to go ahead and just turn off this trigger for now. I don't need it on this intake form. I already have an inspections trigger on this intake form, but I just wanted to show you guys from beginning to end how to build it out. All right. So we've got another question from Heather. Um, can you use an intake form to add additional, uh, add information to an existing transaction or will it only create a new transaction? We create uh, transactions for active listings, and we want to use an intake form to enter the info when we uh, have an accepted offer. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Great question. So currently, the way that they work is that when you fill out that intake form, it's one and done. You've created the property from that intake form. There's no way to get back to fill out an additional intake form to fill out more information on that property. Um, so when you fill out that listing intake form, similar to how I have my listing intake form, all of the information here is going to be unique to that listing intake form. It's going to populate that property. When you go under contract, I have my own sellers one as well that I would fill out additionally to say, now I've gone under contract, I'm going to fill that out. Now, for listings, there's a couple ways that you can handle it. And it kind of depends on what plan you're on. If you're on, um, let's say the grow plan or the pro plan, Usually what I find is I find people having a listing intake form, and then sometimes they have that seller's intake form. It depends on what data you need to track, right? If on your new listings, you're really just tracking like, will there be photos? Is there staging? What kind of photos do we have? 
um, that kind of stuff, then it might not be crucial for when you go under contract, right? The person is already in love with the house. The buyer wants to purchase it. They don't really care about getting the information for the photos or the listing agreement date or the listing expiration date because you're under contract at that point. So if you don't really need the details and the data that you have on that new listing, what we usually suggest is having a under contract intake form. So when you go under contract, instead of you answering questions about what listing services are provided. So I'm going to bring that open really quickly. So this is our listing intake form. Is there someone living there? What listing services provided? Is there an HOA? What kind of lockbox is there, right? This information may not be crucial for when you go under contract, but when you do go under contract, we have a different set of questions that we're going to ask. So going under our sellers under contract, now we're asking more direct questions on like, What's going on with this transaction, right? Are we doing a home inspection? Are the sellers paying any closing costs? Is there a loan? Will there be an inspection? Will there be an appraisal rate? This is stuff more key to that transaction. So depending on how you guys have it set up, you might have a new listing intake form that you fill out that asks about the listing services provided and maybe a couple property questions. And then when you go under contract, you're learning a little bit more about what is unique to that contract, okay? The other reason why we like to have two intake forms, specifically a listing, a new listing and an under contract one for sellers is so that when you're looking at your system, let's say that listing or that, that under contract falls through, you don't want to be in a position where that under contract fell through. And now you have to go and refill out that listing intake form just to get the details that you had already tracked on a, a listing property, right? So for example, we've got West Taylor right here. This is my listing intake form or my listing property version of this. But if I wanted to create another version of this, I could either, once again, fill out that intake form and get that seller's intake form built out, or I could also duplicate this property. So here I can go down to duplicate. I'm going to go ahead and say duplicate. Now, this is the duplicated one. It takes me to it automatically. When we're talking about duplication, what that does is it keeps the fields. So we'll still have those fields. It'll keep the documents. And then it'll also keep the contacts that you currently have on there. So it's not going to add on that buyer that sell or that buyer's agent just yet. It'll just keep the previous ones on here. The next thing you can do is I can edit the name for this. And I'm just going to change this to seller. Oh, I clicked out of it. Here we go. Click back into it. We'll just call this seller under contract. Now I'm only updating the name so that I know when I'm searching in my system, what it looks like. You definitely do not need to have a name convention like this in your title. You can just have it say the address, but for the sake of, you know, this being a test account that I'm showing you guys data in, I think that this is really helpful. But here, now that I've done that, I can apply a property template. So if I'm going to duplicate, I'm going to want to have a property template built out for my sellers under contract. That way I'm bringing on the appropriate fields, the task templates, document templates, whatever I need onto this particular property. If I was filling out that intake form, that intake form would decide, okay, now that I've said yes, I want this to come on, right? So if I refresh this property and we look at it, what I want you guys to take notice is that the details here have changed right? We have a lot more fields in this area now. We've got our appraisal details, finance details, inspection detail, lead-based paint. Even if this house wasn't built during that time, I think that this house, um, this pretend house that I have right here is actually built in like 2010. <laughs> Let's go ahead and say it was built in 2010. So even if I don't need the information, if I use property templates, it's going to bring all that information regardless. It's not using any conditional um, logic. So those are the two ways that you can kind of handle it. You can either have it where you've got that new listing and an additional seller's intake form that you fill out when you go under contract, or you can have it where you have that listing. And then once you go under contract, you create a clone of it. And that clone of it is going to be your new under contract one. You use that property template to apply the fields, bring on document templates, bring on those task templates. Awesome. Next question. I've recently been going through the tasks and adding conditions. The intent is to help new TCs, LCs when they're learning the systems. For example, um, actually enter 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 under the under 
contract date before they're able to check off the task. Yes. So task trigger or task conditions. I'm going to head over to our templates, head over into our task templates, and then take a look at our main buyer one. And I'm just going to click on where it has this little drop down arrow and it's going to expand the view on this. Um, when we're adding on task conditions to our tasks, these task conditions can be really helpful just to make sure that certain things are completed first. So for example, this particular task that I have says send opening emails. Maybe um, in the past when I've been training people or, or me as a new TC getting started in the system, maybe I was having um, some issues with remembering to have all the party members on my intro emails. So having a condition on here that says, well, I need to make sure that the contact role buyer's co-agent or buyer's agent exists in the property, having that as a condition can be really helpful for me, right? Because if I don't have that buyer's agent on that property, I can't check off this task. I have to add in, I have to make sure that that buyer agent exists on the property. So that way, when I send out my opening emails, they receive that correspondence, right? So that's an example of how you can use task conditions to make sure that your tasks are actually, you know, checking, being checked off when they need to. It also helps with that data entry as well. Um, I find a lot of our users, when they're going through and doing this, they're usually starting to think, okay, I'm going to add on a couple conditions onto my tasks. I'm on the scale plan. And then I'm going to start looking into converting to property triggers. The, the um, conditions that you're using for your tasks might be the same conditions that you're using for your property triggers too, right? When you're looking at that property trigger and it says send opening email to closing parties, maybe you want the same conditions as what's on that task. You need to make sure that your buyer's agent's on there, that your lender's on there, that your listing agent's on there, that your seller's on there, that your buyer's on there, whatever party members that you need on there, you know, you can use the same kind of conditions that you're using for your task. So it's a, it's a very wordy um, kind of response to what you were saying, Todd. Let me know if anyone has any follow-up for that. All right, uh, next one. What is the best way to import transactions from January 1st to today? We're just starting with open to close and we want this data and open to close. Yes. So the best way to do it is we're going to head down to, um, so from the dashboard, I'm just going to open up the dashboard. This is what my dashboard looks like. We're going to head over to our three-line icon. We're going to head down underneath our hammer icon here. We're going to click on templates. Once we're on templates, we're going to go down to where it says new import. It looks like it's the third or the second from the bottom, but it's actually the third because marketplace is a, a clickable option. So click on new import. Once you're on new import, you're going to select properties. And then here it's going to show you the fields that are currently available in your system. The main ones that you need to make sure are in there are your contract title, which is typically the address, um, the contract client type, it needs to match what's in open to close. So if you're using buyer, seller, dual um, property manager, uh, tenant, make sure that those options are added into open to close under your field editor. The other one that you need is your contract status. Once again, we want to make sure that those contract statuses are in open to close. So if you're, you know, using like listing active under con or listing active or active listing, we want to make sure that whatever verbiage or however you have it spelt on that spreadsheet matches what's in here within open to close. That way it can correlate the two and say, oh, you said uh, uh, active listing. This spreadsheet says active listing. This particular property is an active listing. The other options that we have are all of the fields here. So here you can see it shows us every single field that's currently available. Here you can see where it's split and it's showing you the different field group. So up here, this is the first field group. And if we continue going down, we've got our next field group with all of our fields, our next field group with all of the field sections within that, intake questions, and then archive fields. So when you're going through and you go to import that particular spreadsheet, usually it's a CSV file. Well, it needs to be a CSV file to import into open to close. You'll go through and you'll be setting up the, um, you'll be mapping those fields as well. So making sure that the naming conventions are similar is probably going to just make it a lot easier for you. Um, sometimes I'll find people who will just like uh, grab the name of something. So let's say on your guys' spreadsheet, it says EDM and you want to update it to earnest money amount. Usually what I use, I find people using is like the, uh, what is that call, called? Like a 
find and replace tool within like Excel or within Google Sheets. That way they can update the name. But if you know the naming conventions, you feel pretty confident with it. You can definitely go through and just manually um, map it um, and say like, well, this one says EDM, but I know that this is the earnest money amount. The earnest money deposits the same, right? It just kind of depends. But this is how I would suggest getting in those properties from January 1st to today. Technically, you can import properties that were from last year if you'd like to. A lot of the time, if people are importing properties like that, it's usually because they want to pull in information for reporting. So exiting out of our template editor, heading down to our reporting tool. Maybe they need to add in some reports here. They need to see, oh, well, let me see last year how much the how many buyers we worked with or sellers that we worked with. And so now you can pull in that report and say, let me see anything that was marked for 2022. Now, I don't have any examples in this account currently because I don't have any properties from 2022 currently. But if I had any properties from 22 currently, I would pull that information in here. Looks like for buyer, it shows us our buyers for, uh, for this year. Again, if we wanted to change it, we could say for 2022 and change that to 2022 and pull a report. Just depends on what you need. Looks like we have a follow-up question for this. Um, for this, if we have earnest money amount on our sheet, will it upload correctly or do we need to map it somewhere else? No, so you just need to make sure that that field's available in your account. So when you're looking at um, importing it, what I would have is I would have that spreadsheet open on one side, you know, one side of your screen or on a different screen. And I would just go through this and I would just make sure that you have it on this side of the screen as well. Um, just to make sure that you have it really, that's the most important part is that, you know, the naming convention for it might be different. It might say earnest money amount on yours, but it might say earnest money deposit or EDM amount on open to close. You'll just want to make sure to map those. Awesome. No worries. Alrighty. Next question. What is the best way to introduce client portals to clients and agent portals to agents? Yes. So agents would be people who are on your team. Um, or there are people that you're working with, right? When we're talking about inviting people to the agent portal, um, obviously you can definitely send them some of the articles about the agent portal. If you're interested in that, we can go to our little person icon. We can click on our support lab. You guys can type in agent portal. Here we've got setup agent portal, contacts for agent portal, uh, intake from the agent portal. You know, that we've got a couple different options. Um, for this, setting up my agent portal just kind of gives them an idea of how to set up their agent portal, um, what comes with it. This is a, a pretty good tool to be able to show them like, hey, this is what comes within your your open to close account when you sign up for us. Um, depending on what we give you access to will depend on what shows up here, right? If you give them access to the intake forms, they get that. So you can definitely share this one with them. Now for client portals, you have the ability to share this, obviously this article with them as well. Now this is internal. Right. This is sharing the client internally, showing them what it looks like for the client portal. Um, for client portal, though, usually what you're doing is you're setting them up on the property itself. Right. So agent portals, you're inviting them through your organization and users heading down to settings, organization and users. You're choosing the uh, the type agent portal user and you're inviting that agent into your system so that that way they can fill out intake forms, review previous properties, um, share API integrations, um, all that kind of good stuff. For your portal roles or for your um, clients, like buyers, sellers, client portal roles, instead you're sending out that invite individually on that property, you know, as you create that property. And here where I click on send portal invite, this will allow me to enter in a message. I can choose a portal role. I can also edit my portal roles as well. So when it comes to like introducing it to the clients, I've actually seen this a lot more adopted recently where clients um, like the ability to be able to like have a system that they log into and like see where their transactions at. Um, and depending on what, uh, what plan you're on, uh, if you're on the scale plan, for example, um, we have that internal messaging system. So sometimes it's easier to get a hold of the buyer if they're super excited about this transaction and you're sending them an internal message on their messaging system um, versus sending them a text or an email, right? Text and email, they're like, cool, yeah, thanks for reaching out to me. But I get a login to a fancy portal 
and I get a fancy email from my tra- buyer's transaction coordinator, it makes you feel special. It's it's kind of a cool thing. So definitely look into that when you're inviting in your buyers. I think that that's going to become a lot more popular um, with a lot of people just because, again, it's a place that they can always log back into to get information. It's a place where you can make sure that the documents are available to them in case you want them to get access to their settlement statement from that portal. There's just a lot of really great things with it, just in case you know they don't have to track you down for later. We can also invite other people through our client portal. So it doesn't have to just be buyers or sellers. It can be lenders. It can be brokers. It can be uh, escrow officers or title officers. It can be whoever you want. Um, it just depends on what kind of permissions you want to give them, right? So for broker owner, I'm probably going to give them permissions to everything. You know, they can see everything as long as they're on that transaction. Typically, when we're talking about a broker owner, I'm not going to want to send out that invite from here on the property. Instead, if I know Hannah is my broker owner, I'm going to want to head to her contact. I'm going to look up Hannah. Here's Hannah. And instead, I'm going to have it set up that she gets that invite automatically because she's the broker and owner, right? So this is me saying that every time that Hannah Hoxie's added to any property, she gets an invite to that property that sends it over so that when she logs into her open to close account, she sees all the properties that she's been added to as the broker owner. Okay. So when we're talking about adding in those people, we don't need to have a unique email every single time to invite them to individual properties. We can use that same email and invite them to multiple properties. How will it look on their end? Well, it's going to look very similar to how our agent portal looks. So when I go to the agent portal, here's for Ansel. When I go into that agent portal here, they're going to see their properties just similar how they'd see their properties here. So if you had a broker, uh, and they wanted, they were on like 23 properties, they would have a transaction or a property table similar to this, where they could go through and they could see all those particular party, uh, properties that they have associated with them. Depending again on what access you give them will depend on what they see here. Right now, it looks like we're looking at the property timeline. We can see the details. We can see the documents, contacts, tasks, emails, notes, if there were any notes shared and messaging, if there were any messages sent regarding this particular property. So getting them into it, I would say, have your agents review the documentation, right? You can definitely pull up, you know, setting your agent portal, properties and tables and segments for agent portal, contacts for agent portal, submitting the intake form for agent portal. All of these here, all of this collection of articles here is great for your agent who's using that agent portal. For your clients, I would tell them that it's a, a read a viewable option um, that they can use to log in to see how their transaction is going, how we're progressing. It's also a place that they can download um, documents or upload documents if they have documents that they need to upload or share. So it's kind of what I would do. Um, and I would usually like probably create like, you know, when you send out that invite, that portal invite through here, I'd have like a personal message typed in here. Like, Hey, wanted to uh, invite you to our, uh, an open to close portal where you can keep track of the timeline, download documents. Um, and you'll have the contact information for X, Y, Z party members. If you need to get a hold of them, right? Something as simple as that could be really, really helpful for those buyers so that they can get that information from whoever they need it. Cool. All right. Next question. Um, is there a way to find a field in the field editor? I'm going mad trying to remember where I put X field. Yes. So there's not really like a search functionality um, native to open to close. But if we head down to our field editor, what I usually suggest is here when we're looking at this transaction details field group, what we can do is we can do control F. If you're on a um, Mac, it's going to be command F. And what this is going to allow you to do is this is going to let you search that page. So if I start to type in listing and it's not bringing me to anything and I'm just sitting on this front page, but it says one of two, right? It says that there's other things on it. It's probably picking up the details from here, listing details. When I click on listing details and I type in listing now it's taking me to everywhere that listing is option. So if you're looking for a specific field and you're like, I have no idea where this is, what you what I usually suggest is using that command F, control F feature, search the web page because it just searches what's on that page and then have it bring you down to wherever it is that that verbiage that you might have used for it. So looking for listing, here's my listing information. 
um, back to transaction details. Maybe I'm looking for all of my dates. So I can type in date and now it's going to highlight the dates. And as I press enter on my keyboard and go through these dates, or if I click on these little drop down arrows, you can see here it's highlighting some of them yellow. That's the standard one. And then orange for all of the other dates. Oh yeah, I get you, Todd. Yeah, definitely. I, I it's something that um that I think that maybe we can investigate into. We've we've added in the search functionality into a couple different areas in the system, right? We've added it into like our uh um you know when we're we're searching for like an agent, um when we're talking about like our integrations right through like dot loop. Um, we've added in like some search functionality into here. I believe there's some some more search functionality on our contacts. There's a couple other places that search search functionality has been added in. The other thing you could probably do is if you know what that field is called and you have it on the property, okay? If you don't have it on the property, a little different. But if you have it on the property, you could go to the property and do control G or command G type in the name of that field. I'm just going to type in date. When I type in date, it's going to show me all the date fields that I have here. Um, now, obviously, again, this is just showing me all the date fields I have on this. It's not showing me the field section that it's in, but this might be one way that you could look at it. The other place that I would suggest if you're like really struggling with like going between each one of the, the sort groups is you could technically head into your template editor head down to your imports, say you want to import a property. And technically, if I type in date here, this is going to take me and show me all of the field sections and the um, the uh, the field groups, right? So if I continue to type in date, check it out. It just took us down to a completely different field group and to our listing details. So this could also be another way if you're like, I need to really quickly find this. Head to your head to your your new import. Check out your properties and say, okay, cool. These are all the fields that I currently have. Um, what do I need to look in? This could also be another place where if uh, if you're looking for just like a really quick list of all the fields within your system, this is a really fast way to just be like, and I got the fields in my system <laughs> right here. Boom, field selected in my system. Maybe I need to bring that into a specific spreadsheet and and do something more with the data. This might be helpful too. For anyone else who's looking for like kind of shortcuts um, to kind of locate fields. Cool. All right. So the other kind of, uh, let me know if there's any more questions, definitely feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Um, the other kind of top of mind FAQs that we've gotten recently are on date templates, specifically talking about conditional date calculation and the number field. So let's go ahead and head down to our hammer icon head into templates, head into date templates. Here, I'm going to just go ahead and say, I'm going to add in a new one. That way we can look at it fresh. Some of you guys are going to want to see it fresh, not just customizing what we already have. Here's what a date template looks like when it's fresh. I'm going to go ahead and add on my earnest money due date. Let's add on my um, let's say my loan application due date, let's say my loan approval due date, and let's add in my inspection period due date. So right now I've added in these due dates in here. These are my dates that things are going to be due. I'm going to click on my earnest money due deposit here. And I see that there's some red options that I need to fill out. Here where it says days, I can add in a number. If my standard contracts say that my earnest money is due in three days, I can put in three. Next, I can choose when is that going to be due. So I can say business days and I can say it's after. And then here where it says date field option, I can say execution date, acceptance date, intake date, whatever that looks like. So let's go ahead and say execution date in this example. That could also be my contract acceptance date as well, just in case anyone uses different kind of verbiage. Now, the other option with this that we're kind of talking about is also choosing a conditional date. So what if it's not always three? What if sometimes you get an addendum and it says that it's actually one date or it's in five days or it's in six days or 10 days? How do we make sure to update this hard-coded date here from three to 10, right? We can here now relate it to a number field. So when I click on number field, I'm gonna see a, a couple different options here. We're gonna locate earnest money due days. 
And now when I say update, the way that this is going to work is it's going to say either or, either it's going to be three business days after execution date, or if we have a value in earnest money due days field, it'll be that value business days after execution date. So when I'm looking at my property and I'm just going to go ahead and go to Ivy Lane here and I have Ivy Lane, here's my earnest money due days. Here it says it's on the 15th. I actually need to change this. It's due in one day. I can press one, press enter. This is going to update to the 13th. Why did it update to the 13th? Because this is showing right here, contract date 13th. I most likely have the 13th as like a weekend. Um, I could also say that I want it to be on the same day as, right? If I update that date, it's actually not one day. It's not the same day as contract acceptance. I want it to be, um, let's say, and again, this is contract date, not execution date. My execution date is on the 12th. So that's why it's saying here, execution date, the 13th, right? So if I put in five, I can also update that to five and say, well, it's actually due five days after uh, execution date. And that's going to be on the 17th. So as I update that field here, this due days field, it's going to update that due date field. And then now I don't have to worry about counting on my fingers or counting on a calendar and going, wait, is that a holiday? Is that not a holiday? Did Labor Day just happen? Um, you can instead rely on open to close to um, kind of calculate that due date for you. Now, Part two of kind of looking at your date calculations is also probably considering um, your holidays. So I'm going to open up that one again. When we're talking about the rest of the options here, we can, again, say what count days using. I'm going to go ahead and say business days to keep it the same as this, right? When we're counting out when how we're doing that, we want it to be based off of the business days as well. We could also say calendar days if we want to here. This is just saying that it's going to count the weekends, right? But it's going to land probably on the business days. If that is the case, we can go down to weekend roll. Here we can update that to roll backwards or roll forwards, either one if we want to. Um, great question. What are holidays uh, consider? What holidays are considered in open to close? So I believe it's the standard like federal holiday list. Um, now there are some additions that we have not made like or added into open to close yet because like I believe that Juneteenth was is considered a federal holiday now and I don't believe that's in open to close but we have this fantastic feature that our developers built out because sometimes holidays can be unique to like the the city sometimes it can be unique to the state right maybe you guys have snow days or you need to add in a snow week and you're not able to get to the property to have those inspections done just in case in california we don't really need to worry too much about that we have fire <laughs> we don't really need to worry about snow days so if you need to add in additional dates we're going to exit out of our template editor we're going to head down to our gear icon we're going to get into our global settings once we're in our global settings we're going to head down to our and i Oh, federal holidays. There we go. I was hovering right over it. So down underneath organization settings, federal holidays, and this is going to show us the federal holidays that are currently in your guys' system. So these federal holidays are probably going to be pretty exact to what you guys have as well. So here you can see that we're either doing New Year's Day, which is January 1st, or um, Martin Luther King Day, which is the third Monday in January. Washington's birthday, it looks like that's the third Monday in um, February. If I continue to scroll down, we can also say, you know, Juneteenth specifically happens on a day. Independence Day specifically happens on a day. So here you can kind of add in the other dates that you might need. Maybe you guys take all of that Thanksgiving week off. You can set it up where you say, hey, this is what it looks like for that. And you can also set it up that it has a specific role. So for here, if we look at um, Thanksgiving Day, fourth Thursday in um, November, here we can say if it lands on a Saturday, do we want to set up some innate rules? Does it need to roll forwards or roll backwards? So we put in roll forward to Friday, roll backwards to Friday or roll forward to Monday, right? So here you could say, well, I, I, if it does go to that date and that date is on my date calculator, I want it to follow these rules here or it will just default to whatever you put on that date template. So this is how you'd add in those dates that we do not have in open close are the ones that we might be missing. If you if you find that you're like, oh, this scheduled and it shouldn't have, you can add in a due date here or holiday here. And what that's going to do is it's going to update it so that that way, you know, it doesn't land on that particular holiday. 
Awesome. We are at the last five minutes of today's call. Um, I really appreciate all of your guys' questions. Um, as always, I'll do my little snippet, but you guys are definitely feel free to um, drop in more questions into the Q&A if you have any. Um, as always, if you guys are interested in reaching out to us, you can reach out to us at help, but open to close. You can also message us here by going down to our little chat icon and sending us a message, or you can review the previous messages that you've sent to us. If we sent you some loom videos next, um, if you guys are looking for more webinars, you can head to our open to close, um, webpage, head over to the learn tab and go to webinars. Once you're on those webinars, you're going to want to scroll down, locate the webinar that you want to um, join. So for example, here's tasks and triggers. You'll click on register and that's going to pull open that registration page. And here you can register for that particular um, class. These classes are repeating. So right now we're starting at the very beginning of our circuit where we're doing fields. And um, we covered that today. Um, and next week we're going to be covering task triggers 101 and contacts 101. Um, definitely come with like notebooks. Um, if you guys want to write down notes, um, we also record those calls as well. So if you ask a lot of very particular questions, you want a copy of the recording that you were on, um, definitely, um, like feel free to reach out for that because we will have a copy of it and we can share that with you guys. We do have a set number of classes that have already been recorded and already have been uploaded to open and close, um, that are, uh, are pretty decent, um, but again, they might be answering questions that were not answered live, right, from you. So if you want the ones that you asked specifically, definitely ask for the recording that, that you know, from here that you joined, from the the, the date that you joined. Um, if not, and you're okay with pre-recorded content, you can definitely reach out to our team and we can offer that pre-recorded content too, especially if you want to like run with it and you're like, I'm ready to get started. Get me in now. I don't want to wait a week. I want to watch them all, all at once. Um, it's, it's not a bad idea. A lot of the times when I see people join in our webinars, they're usually joining it three or four times. Sometimes they're joining one call multiple times, right? There's a lot of content that I go over in these calls. For example, last, uh, yesterday we went over emails, text messages, and messaging. And I not only talked about email templates and text templates and messaging templates. I did a deep dive on smart blocks. I talked about, um, what else did I talk about? I talked about the messaging feature and how that can be utilized. You know, there's a lot of content that we cover on it. So joining it multiple times saying, I'm going to focus on just this part of the training. And then, you know, maybe I'll have Hannah talking in the background <laughs> about the other subjects. You can do something like that. Um, you can also join to say, okay, well, I know for sure next week, if Hannah's going to be talking about tasks and triggers, I know that this is where I'm going to join. So I can ask about property triggers because I want to start building those out. You can absolutely join and we can do a deep dive on that on call. Awesome guys. Thank you so much for joining us again today. Um, thank you, Todd, uh, uh, for joining uh, us as well. I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your, um, day. Um, hopefully we see you on Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. If not, have a wonderful rest of your week. Have a wonderful rest of um, September in case I don't see you guys before the end of September. Other than that, um, I will talk with you guys later.